two seconds. <clears throat> Okay, there are still people joining. Okay, now it looks like uh, it's converging. Okay, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to this um, uh, August edition of, uh, of Data at Breakfast. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione. I uh, invented this series and I'm responsible for you waking up early on, on Friday mornings. <clears throat> this morning, I'm very happy to, to be able to introduce to you Dr. Zanda uh, Venta. <clears throat> and uh, um, I'm really grateful to him because a few weeks ago or 10 days ago, I read one of his articles in, in the conversation about the topic of today's uh, uh, webinar and I thought that's perfect for our data breakfast and uh, I emailed him and um, he immediately <clears throat> agreed to give us a, a, a webinar and, and here he is this morning. Yeah? So Zander did uh, about a year ago his PhD in agroecology at the University of, of Cape Town and since a year uh, he moved to Norway, where he's working as a spatial ecologist <clears throat> and, and data scientist at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research. <clears throat> yeah. um, most of his work is on uh, vegetation dynamics and ecosystem service. Yeah. And um, uh, he writes in his uh, bio that in his spare time, he enjoys leveraging his data science skills to answer questions about society and its relationship with nature. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and the topic of his talk is mapping South Africa's green appetite using satellite remote sensing and cloud computing. So it's really uh, a very interesting and, and, and fascinating topic. On the panel, uh, you see in the top bar, also Mahesh Naidu, Professor Mahesh Naidu. She's uh, at UKZ10, she's an anthropologist by, by profession. Yeah? And, uh, and has a weakness also for GSI systems. And she's part of the big data and informatics research flagship of, of UKZ10. And she kindly agreed to, <clears throat> to moderate the question and answer session after the presentation of, um, of Dr. Venter. Um, as you know, people are probably all expert uh, Zoomers. At the bottom of your screen, there is a button with Q&A, where you're most than welcome to, <clears throat> to type in your questions and, and Mahesh will, will moderate them after the talk. Also on the panel is Dr. Sinaiski, who is a co-host of, of, of this event and is just the, the, the backup plan in case ESCOM pulls the plug in my part of town and he has all the rights to keep going with the, with the event. So Zanda, um, thank you very much for being with us here this morning and uh, you're most than welcome now to start sharing your screen and start your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesco. Um, okay. Yeah, we are in the, yeah, if you put it on, uh, on slideshow, we are 100% Perfect. There we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's it feels strange presenting to a, an audience in South Africa all the way here from from Norway. This is our our summer over here, but the temperature temperatures I think are similar to the Durban or the KZN winters. So for us, uh, we're busy sunbathing and it's twenty degrees outside. Um, it's a quite a contrast to South Africa. But anyway. Um, yeah, today I'm just going to talk about uh, some recent work I did with South Africa with a, a group of South African colleagues um, mapping South Africa's green apartheid and you might wonder what the term green apartheid means but I hope uh, later you'll you'll get a better understanding of what it is but it's important to note that um, this is based on a co collaboration with some colleagues Charlie Shackleton from Rhodes University, Francini van Staden Odirilwe Solomani and Vanessa Masterson, and um, yeah, they they helped a lot. Um, they are more on the, uh, some of them are more on the social science and anthropology side of things, whereas I come from more of the technical um, data science and ecology background. So this was quite a, a new thing for me, stepping a bit out of my comfort zone, but it was a good experience nevertheless. So um, the the broad 
story or the story I want to tell in this presentation follows these sort of steps. First, I'll just touch on some anecdotes of spatial inequality, so some, some um, scenes of inequality that I've noticed in South Africa and that I'm sure many of you who live there have noticed as well. And then um, number two, eyes in the sky, can we map inequality from space? So I'll touch on a bit on the technical side of remote sensing um, uh, uh, with relevance to this project. Um, then thirdly, I will actually present the data that we, or the results we found from our remote sensing analysis um, using satellite imagery to quantify South Africa's green apartheid. And um, then I'll touch on a bit, uh, a bit on the more political side of things, which is the sort of so what and who's to blame. And finally, what next? What can we do about this? Um, so yeah. Uh, and also just to mention that this presentation is based on, um, as Francesco mentioned, the, the conversation article uh, recently published. And that was uh, in turn based on a, a scientific paper published in the journal Landscape and Urban Planning, um, where all the details on the methodology um, are published. And if you want to read up more uh, in more detail, um, please go ahead and and look that up. It's, it should be yeah, it's open access, so anyone can download it. Um, so I'll start with some sort of anecdotes of the spatial inequalities. And this is zooming into two suburbs in Joburg. This is Athol, relatively a lot of tree cover, low density housing, compared to just a kilometer or so away, Alexandra, which is quite a densely populated um, dense uh, urban infrastructure with relatively few trees um, scattered around the suburb. This is another example in Cape Town. Um, here it's flying into Nutuk and um, this is a security a gated community called the Lakes and just bordering it over this wetland stretch is a, a settlement that is very densely populated and this is just a still image taken by a drone um, and uh, you can see that, again, the, the gated community has relatively you know, much bigger garden space, um, there's blue infrastructure, blue infrastructure, the lakes, and um, a lot of vegetation in between. In contrast, on the bottom, of course, there's virtually no green space in between the houses. Finally, I'll fly into uh, Durban, uh, namely Clare Estate. And this is um, another example of a, a contrast of a short distance where you can see the houses on this hill have relatively large gardens, lots of space around them compared to the settlement on the southern slope there. And um, this is another drone image um, where there are some trees in between, but I mean, in contrast to the suburb on top of the hill, it's very densely populated with not much access to green space. So yeah, these, uh, these are extreme examples um, and they sort of anecdotes that I think, well, I can talk, talk for myself personally, I, growing up in Johannesburg and living in Cape Town for many years, um, I, you know, driving around the city, it's many of these spatial inequalities are very obvious and I notice them all the time. And um, uh, since I've started working with GIS data, spatial data and remote sensing satellite data, um, the question came to me, you know, can I map this from space? Can I use satellite imagery to quantify um, these inequalities or these spatial um, uh, discrepancies from space? So this is a, a uh, little animation showing all the satellites in orbit around the Earth at the moment. And there are 2,666 satellites at, at the moment in orbit around the world. So this is a huge number. And about a quarter of these, 26%, are there for Earth observation. So they have cameras facing back down on the Earth, you know, observing it, taking pictures of it. Um, and there's some recent startup companies, like the one called Planet, uh, which are now taking a high resolution image of the entire world every day, which um, 
yeah, is quite incredible. Um, and the, the data management, data engineering to handle that amount of data is quite, is also very impressive. But th that, so there's a lot of commercial um, companies that are providing the satellite imagery, but then there's also um, like the European Space Agency and NASA that have satellites taking pictures of the Earth and that they make these pictures or images open access, openly available. So I'm just going to touch on some of the, the platforms that I've used to do this analysis. And this is maybe a bit more technical than some of you would like, but it might be interesting for some. So on the left um, uh, is Google Earth Engine is a, is a cloud computing platform. So for those of you who don't know what cloud computing is, it's essentially instead of performing uh, uh, getting your computer to perform analyses and um, store data, um, you're outsourcing this job in a sense to company third parties or companies that do that on a much bigger scale. So Google have a bunch of uh, big computers in places like Northern Norway or, or um, cold areas of the world to reduce energy costs. Um, but they can do this computing for me. And through this platform, Google Earth Engine, and through a programming language like Python or JavaScript, I can, I can send them instructions essentially on what analysis I want them to do. And they do it uh, thousands of times faster than I could do on my little laptop here at home. Um, so yeah, they have massive parallelization of computing and Google Earth Engine also has a huge uh, cloud um, database of over 40 petabytes of satellite imagery, which you can query and analyze. And so then in the middle here, um, once I query and process the satellite imagery, I usually bring, bring it down into something, something like R Studio, which is um, very good for statistical analysis, for data visualization, so creating graphs and plots, and also data wrangling, so reshaping and um, adjusting data frames and matrices. And this package, a group of packages called the Tidyverse are very useful for that. And then I don't know if, if this can be moved, uh, but uh, the one on the right here, OpenStreetMap is a, a volunteer geographic information. So people around the world um, digitize geographic information on the Earth's surface. And this is open source, it's provided to everyone. And so a lot of the, the maps you might have in your um, in, in some of your cell phone applications will have information that's collected and made available in OpenStreetMap. So this is just a satellite image time lapse of deforestation in the Amazon. And this is just to showcase the power of Google Earth Engine, which is processing hundreds of satellite imagery. This is going back to 1984. Um, and stitching them together, pre-processing them, clearing cloud cover, um, mosaic, mosaicing them, and then creating a time lapse. And you can literally do this within a few minutes. Um, this is one I made of Theavatuskluft Dam in uh, the Western Cape during the drought uh, we had a few years ago. And um, again, this was easy to make within a few minutes um, once you have the scripts to do it. And finally, this is one north of Richards Bay, and this is uh, mining in the sand dunes along the coast here um, from 1984 to present. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite a powerful way to visualize um, change over time. Instead of looking at a graph, a static graph, you can look at uh, these videos of, of change. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk about, uh, just step you through the methods that I used uh, specifically in this analysis to map. Our goal was to map green space and green space is quite a, a broad term. A lot of people use the word green infrastructure. So this includes things like trees, grass, parks, um, road verges, um, nature reserves within the urban environment. So, um, so I used a combination of the satellite imagery and the open source um, geographic information to do this. And 
let me just say this this image here is a sat high resolution satellite image of Rondebosch East in um, Cape Town, and I'll just use it as an example. Um, what what you see here, we did for all of the uh, urban areas in South Africa. So the first thing we mapped was NDVI, which is a satellite um, index for the normalized difference vegetation index, and uh, it uses uh, information collected in the near infrared near infrared wavelengths, which are reflected um, quite strongly by chlorophyll in plant leaves. And essentially, the the greener the plant, the more productive the plant high reflectance you have in the near infrared and then the higher the NDVI index. Um, so in this image you can see areas where that are green have relatively high NDVI. And you'll also notice here that um, these areas are um, clipped to uh, private so gardens and houses and uh, we essentially used the uh, South African road network to do that. And, but we also measured NDVI in the public space. So this is now NDVI within the, within the road verges. Um, so think of pavements and um, uh, road islands. And then we also mapped it within the parks, again using the OSM data. The next thing we mapped was tree cover, fractional tree cover. And um, this is, uh, based on a, a methodology that involves machine learning, uh, a machine learning workflow where we collect um, reference data of what fractional, different classes of fractional tree cover look like and we train machine learning model that can then classify satellite images um, uh, yeah, as to what level of, of tree cover they have. And again, we did this in private space and again on the streets and in the, um, in the park. Then um, we used the OSM data to identify parks and we calculated the, the area, the coverage of each park, so the size of the park. And we also calculated the, from any point in the neighborhood, the proximity to the park, closest park or distance to the closest park. Um, yeah, as a measure of access to green space. So these were the main indicators of how of green space or how we quantified and mapped green space over the entire uh, urban area of South Africa. And so this is the um, remote sensing information on green space. Then we also have the ability to overlay um, socio-demographic data. So from Statistics South Africa, let me go back, sorry. From Statistics South Africa, we collected all of the census unit, census tracts that were classified as urban, and they are designated in red here on this map. And for each of those, we have information uh, on the population group or race, and these categories are um, uh, black, African, colored, Indian, and white. And these categories are used, uh, I guess, are derived from the original apartheid classification. And this map here is just an example of Rondebosch again, where each dot here is 10 citizens and each dot is colored by the race um, uh, demographic. And then we also had household income um, for each of these census tracts. So um, yeah, you could calculate uh, mean monthly income for each of the census tracts. So then what we did was essentially overlay the the green space data and the socio-demographic data, and then we can start to see how um, the distribution of green, green space um, maps across socio-demographic geographies. Um, so this is an overview of the results. So these pie charts just show, tell the story uh, for the whole of South Africa in percentages. And on the left here, um, so on the left here, is the percentage share of the urban population. So let's take um, the green here, white uh, census, tra census tracts with white citizens um, constitute 15.8% of the population. Then if you look at the share of income, um, they have almost 60% share of the income. So um, dis it's a disproportionate share, obviously, of the income, of the national income. And then if you look at the share of the urban greenery, they have 30% share. So 
uh, relative to their population, it's double. And in contrast, if you look at African uh, or Black African, um, they constitute about 70% of the urban population in South Africa. They have a much smaller share of the income and um, almost uh, a third of, of, the, of what their share of the urban greenery should be based on their population. And the same goes for Indian and colored um, demographics. So that's a broad scale picture. And now I'll, sh I'll show you some graphs which, uh, which are looking in more detail at the, uh, so let me just walk you through these graphs here on the x-axis is the per capita monthly income plotted with a log scale. And on the y-axis, let's first take the top graph here is this NDVI index. So that's a measure of vegetation greenness or productivity. And each point, each little dot on this map, they look a bit like a blur, but each point is a census tract in South Africa. And I've, on the y-axis is the relative difference to the city mean. So for each um, district municipality, we calculated this census tract difference to the mean for the uh, municipality. Um, this makes it, you're able to compare relative greenness, for example, in Etagwini or in Durban, um, which is a very green suburb compared to, for example, an extreme would be Uppington, um, where it's very dry. But if you're looking at the relative greenness, um, you can compare them across space. So then we fitted these linear regression lines and you can see that overall as um, per capita income increases, there's an increase in the uh, census tract greenness. And the same goes for tree cover down here. Um, and the different color lines are for the different color, uh, different um, population groups. And so that was in private space. And now if we look at public space, so this is looking at street verges, we see very much the same pattern as income increases, urban greenery uh, of the census tract increases as well. And finally, um, let me just move this. Um, if we look at parks, um, so on the y-axis here is distance to park in kilometers, also on the log scale, and per capita monthly income on the x-axis. And you can see that as um, income increases, the census tract uh, on average people live closer to a in closer proximity to a park. So um, I think I'm just trying to remember the statistics. I think for um, black citizens on average, um, they would have to walk something like 17 minutes to get to their closest park, compared to white citizens would have to walk on average seven minutes. And if you look at that on the income scale, I think at a mean monthly income of a thousand rand per month, um, you have to walk 26 minutes to get to your closest park. But if you're earning 30,000 rand a month, um, on average, you would, you would likely walk eight minutes to your closest park. So um, that just um, puts it into perspective, uh, puts the graph or puts some statistics to the graph. Um, so um, essentially, uh, uh, these maps are showing the data presented in, in these graphs. Um, so for each district municipality, we are plotting the slope of this linear regression line. So positive slopes indicate um, a, uh, an inequality where high income areas have high access to the green space. So on the map on the left here, this is for NDVI um, greenness regressed on log of income. And um, so the larger the circle, the higher the R squared value and the darker red, the stronger the positive correlation between the two. And for tree cover regressed on income, um, we have the same thing. And what was remarkable was that, which I didn't really expect was that virtually all of uh, the district municipalities in South Africa exhibit this positive correlation between income and access to green space, um, indicating a, an inequality, spatial inequality. Um, the only two that sort of bucked the trend down here um, uh, were um, Nkanyakunde District Municipality and Tambo District Municipality. These, so these were two where um, the trend was actually inversed uh, 
where um, lower income areas had a slightly higher access to green areas than high income areas. Um, so this, this spatial inequality and what we termed as a green apartheid um, is prevalent virtually across the whole of South Africa, urban South Africa. Um, and um, I just had uh, put this map here of Itabrini municipality. I'm assuming a lot of you listening are from Durban. Natal and um, so here on the left we have the dominant race per census tract and I'll just take Hillcrest here as an example of this green suburb um, predominantly white citizens in the center here is mean monthly income and you can see Hillcrest has a much uh, yellower color which indicates higher per capita income and then uh, sit, uh, suburb greenness or census tract greenness relative to the city mean and again you can see it's much greener than the rest of the city um, and the graphs on the bottom here are just uh, three another way of representing income in the third dimension so the height of these census tracts indicates the income of that census tract and um, you can see that uh, it's just another way of visualizing the spatial inequality So um, that's the sort of more data side, uh, what we found, the patterns we found. And um, now I'm gonna cross over a bit into a bit more of the political space. And a um, big disclaimer here is that anything I say from here on is uh, what I would say is evidence-based conjecture. Um, uh, yeah, we, we essentially wanna explain why we termed it green apartheid. And it, I would argue that it's based on evidence but um, in no way are we pointing the finger or attributing blame in one way or the other. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the reaction we've had to the conversation article and some other popular articles we've published, um, the overwhelming reaction has been negative. Uh, and I think it's because, um, well, I'll go into it a bit. Yeah, essentially, um, the natural question is to ask, you know, who's to blame for this spatial inequality? Is it the ANC? Is it the current government? Have they failed us? Are we, should we point fingers on the past and at the apartheid system that led to these geographies of, of race and income? Or is it also civil society? Are we as individuals or groups um, also to take some responsibility for these inequalities? Um, well, I'll just share with you some of the feedback on Twitter, which is not a good rep, uh, not a good sample of the average opinion uh, in South Africa, but nevertheless, it's insightful. Um, so when we uh, these were posted, when we posted um, the article on Twitter, some of the responses. I'm just going to read out some. These are anonymized, of course. Um, so some people responded, "Now even having a garden is racist. Black trees matter now." Um, the ANC have kept those pe these people uneducated and poor and dependent on social grants. Greenery space is the least of their worries. Yes, when hordes of people invade land, strip the vegetation bare and build shacks everywhere, they're referring to uh, the cause of the inequality or the yeah, uneven distribution of green space. Africa's answer to colonization equals decolonized forests. The former white areas planted trees in their gardens as that is what civilized people do. Again, what exactly is preventing a township from creating a green space and planting trees? So a lot of these um, comments were had <laughs> huge racist undertones, but I suppose on social media, you tend to bring out the extremes opinions. Uh, Mama Lodi was greener, green prior, they burned it for firewood. Typically because of superstition and fear of snakes, most African people dislike trees or bushes too close to their houses. And this one's probably one of my favorites, um, referring to our term green apartheid in our title. Why not make the heading even more controversial like nature Nazis, tree holocaust, plant genocide? Um, so in some ways it's funny, but in other ways, I, it, was, it was quite shocking and disappointing, quite frankly, because I suppose I, I hope that the broader conversation around topics of inequality like this are more constructive than divisive and negative. And it wasn't in no way our intention for this to be a race baiting exercise or to um, elicit responses like this, not at all. 
it was merely, um, I suppose, as science, we're trying to um, reduce uncertainty and we're trying to convey truth in some way about reality. And that's uh, what I was trying to do in writing this. Um, but now I'll just move on to explain a bit about why I use the term green apartheid. And this graph in our manuscript is quite central. So on the x-axis here, we have um, dates from 1990 to present or 2019. And on the y-axis, we have um, difference in city greenness, percentage difference from the city mean. So this dash line is the zero line, anything above that, uh, these census tracts have on average higher greenness relative to the average for the city. Anything below have lower greenness relative to the city mean. And the reason why we could go back in time is because the satellite imagery, specifically from the Landsat satellite archive provided by NASA, um, have flown over and taken images all the way back to the 1980s. So we were able to go back and map the green space geographies um, uh, yeah, at the end of apartheid, all the way up until present. And what is what was quite um, striking was that, for example, so these lines are uh, dash lines are lowest regression lines and a linear regression line and solid. And for on average, for census tracts dominated by white citizens, there's been an increase in their share of the city greenness. Whereas in red here, um, black dominated census tracts have actually declined in their share of city greenness, whereas for colored and Indian, it sort of remained relatively even. So this was in some ways surprising and shocking because um, you would expect that uh, since apartheid ended and since we tried uh, and the government um, uh, has made huge efforts to uh, uh, redress inequality, that these lines, you would expect all of these lines to be sort of converging around the zero line so that there's an equal share of green space across these geographies. But that's not the case. And so uh, for us, it's very evident that this green inequality is rooted in apartheid geographies, hence the term green apartheid. But at the same time, uh, we're not um, saying that everything should be blamed on the past. Um, the current government has largely failed to plan for and maintain urban green infrastructure. Um, and this is also in some ways understandable given that they have, uh, they've had huge pressures to address things like housing, simple things like housing and education. Um, so it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but I think it's also worth asking how we as individuals have perpetuated spatial in injustices. It's easy for us to point the finger at government or the past, um, but we all ultimately have some role to play in this. Um, so I'll quickly touch on um, sort of what's next. Uh, uh, and we, um, our paper and our work has mostly been to describe um, this inequality, not to try and find solutions to it. So yeah, again, this is a bit of conjecture and um, hopefully others can do more work on this sort of thing. What can we do about this? But South Africa does have the Spatial Planning and Land Use Management Act 2013, which provides really good legislative basis for equitable access to green infrastructure and green space in urban areas. And it's maybe too soon to really um, judge or assess how effective that has been implemented. Um, but um, they definitely, it's evident that there are obstacles in the implement for government to implement um, these legislature like this. So with RDB housing, for example, there's very, very seldom do they um, cater for green spaces or um, vegetation planting or parks. And um, there has been some work done to show that it, it comes down to things like poor communication, corruption in government. Um, and also the perception that green space is an optional luxury for people. Like, um, it's, not that ne it's not that necessary. And if, if we forget about it, it's okay. Um, so in terms of solutions, there's also citizen science. So in a sense, what I did using satellite imagery um, to analyze uh, green space distribution um, is a way of democratizing information so that we can hold government accountable ultimately if they say we're going to do an urban greening initiative in Durban, 
um, you know, we can use satellite imagery to measure that and to and hold them accountable if they fail. Um, and then finally, the more grassroots initiatives. So uh, you can actually go out there and plant trees yourself. And the organisations like Green Pop in the Western Cape that plant trees in marginalised communities and do great work. But I think grassroots initiatives can only take us so far. You know, we do need structural changes as well and government to come. Uh, and then finally, I could have had this slide in the very beginning of the presentation, but sort of the whole thing hinges on the assumption that green space is good. And um, uh, otherwise, it wouldn't really matter, right? So uh, there's a huge amount of evidence globally to show, yes, green space does matter. Firstly, um, a recent study in the Eastern Cape by one of my colleagues, Ch Charlie Shackleton, shows that it provides a huge amount of jobs. So the gardening sector in just 12 towns in the Eastern Cape um, contributes an average annual turnover of 500 million rand. And in Joburg, there are also similar estimates. There's a huge amount of job creation and um, income com coming from the gardening sector. Um, secondly, green infrastructure provides food. So there's a lot of urban agriculture that can um, reduce food insecurity in cities. Um, Trees and vegetation regulate stormwater, so when we have big um, rains, it can uh, reduce the risk of flooding. It cleans the air of pollutants, um, and it also reduces extreme heat, which is something we might worry about with um, changing climate and global warming. And then, uh, sorry, um, finally, it, or it promotes social cohesion and spiritual wellness. So there are a lot of psychological studies that show how green spaces act as a place for communities to come together to socialize. And um, it's important for, in some people's religions and spiritual perspective. And finally, and probably most obviously, it benefits recreation. So space to enjoy the outdoors, enjoy nature, um, and this is hugely important for physical and mental health. And um, in a time like a pandemic, like the coronavirus or COVID-19, um, there's been studies to show that it, um, urban green space acts as this sort of buffer or space for people to safely um, distance themselves uh, uh, during a pandemic. Um, so yeah, green space does matter. Um, there also needs to be a lot of work done on assessing how different uh, ethnicities uh, and groups in South Africa value green space. So these these values I've put on these the slide are not universal. Of course, some people. So in some uh, poorer areas, trees may act as a as a hiding place for criminals, for example, and contribute to a landscape of fear um, for citizens. So Greenery is not always a good thing, but on the whole, on average, um, it is a good thing. But there needs to be more work done on how different people value green space and that can also help target greening initiatives across South Africa. Um, so yeah, that's the end of the presentation. I just wanted to say that you're welcome to email me, ask me any questions you have. Um, there's also, uh, we with our publication, we made a, an online, interactive web application where you can zoom in around South Africa to different municipalities and look at um, information for different uh, uh, cities and plot the data. And um, yeah, you're welcome to go ahead and do that. And then also, of course, refer to the scientific publication where um, we hopefully have outlined our assumptions and our methodology in, in much more detail. Um, yeah. So I think, that's it. Should I stop sharing the screen, Francesco? Um, Alexander, no, maybe just keep it in case uh, some of the questions will maybe refer to, to, to some of the slides. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, Zander, thank you very much for the, the, the really very in, informative talk. And uh, you know, it, uh, it fits perfectly with what uh, we want to achieve with the data breakfast, which is to, to stress the, 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 the importance of uh, evidence-based analysis grounded on, on, on solid uh, data analysis. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. thank you really, you know, there are things that we all assume are there or not there. Yeah. 
and, and it's always very important to see the the the, um, the naked facts yeah <laughs> and uh, that puts it in a completely different uh, perspective yeah and you know it's always if you can measure things you can improve them yeah if you don't bother measuring them it's very difficult to to make any improvement or any correction yeah. But I see we have lots of questions, so it means you, you, you touch the hearts of lots of people. Uh, <laughs> can I ask you, Mahesh, to please uh, guide us through the questions so that Zanda can, uh, can answer them? And I see we have plenty of time to dedicate to the questions. Uh, thanks, Zanda. That's um, quite an eye-opening uh, presentation <laughs> in very literal terms as well. And uh, I want to start by saying that I liked most what you seemed most apprehensive about, which was the, the titling of the paper, uh, or, or part titling as Green Apartheid. And, and I thought, wow, that's a stroke of genius, because uh, what you've done is added to the palette of uh, black and white. You've added another layer of, uh, of fuel, a color as green. And it points to another layer of uh, disenfranchisement uh, wrought by the machinery of apartheid. And I was quite apprehensive that there'll be a whole lot of technical questions, but the board lit up when you when you shifted to the political and the sociological. Um, and quite a few questions are posted in the chat. And um, I'll try and draw from one or two so you can jump straight into it. And although your disclaimer was that you are not a sociologist or anthropologist, you'll find that you're going to have to kind of uh, wind your way through some of those queer <laughs> kinds of questions. Um, yeah. I'll start off with, with one that says, yeah, it, it thanks you for your uh, work and asks, have you looked at the planning norms for development in South Africa and how have they changed? Uh, have you looked at the different groups behavior in response to green space? Uh, so that's kind of, uh, asking you to weld together sociological responses as an overlay to this kind of uh, profoundly important quantitative work that you've done. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately I, I don't have a, a wealth of, <laughs> I haven't done a lot of reading on the literature on this topic, but um, on the second last or the third last slide there, I do allude to something like a, spe a, a spruma or a spatial land use in, um, Planning Act. So on the legislative side or the, the urban planning side, you know, there has been a development in the legislature, um, but um, it's difficult. We had a, one of our co-authors, Fran, uh, Francini van Staden, actually works for Western Cape government, um, which is nice to have someone sort of on the inside to, she pr provided some great perspectives and she contributed to a discussion on, on the legislative side, but um, from conversations with her and uh, it, it seems like it's still early days for us to um, say with any certainty whether um, people's responses and urban planners responses have changed substanti substantially in response to that legislat legislation. Um, but I think definitely um, globally and I think in South Africa um, at least on the science and academic side and in the urban planning and architecture side um, uh, again it's a bit anecdotal but I, I have the feeling that a lot of people are, are waking up to these these inequalities and are definitely trying to incorporate um, princ design principles into urban planning that facilitate green infrastructure and also blue infrastructure which is something I didn't talk about but including um, water bodies and water in urban design. Um, so yeah, I hope I sort of answered that question, but um, it's, again, it's a bit out of my expertise. Yeah, a lot of the questions seem to be fired up by you know, the environmental justice and the social justice uh, um, aspects of the paper. Uh, and, and we can come back to that. Uh, one of the participants asking, though, have you compared your data to other countries that didn't, you know, have apartheid, but a similar GINI coefficient? I don't claim yeah. to understand what that coefficient is, but you're going to tell us. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure what the coefficient is, but in general, um, there's definitely been a lot of work, uh, mostly in the global north, so in high-income countries, um, and it's very clear that the patterns are similar. And these are, are countries without a, a, leg, a apartheid legacy. 
um, they are definitely not as extreme as we found in South Africa, uh, uh, but there definitely are inequalities and, and it's predominantly across income geographies and not necessarily race. It's not as strongly correlated to race as it is in South Africa. And of course, I would say that's because of our apartheid history. But these um, generally as suburbs, uh, um, especially I think with immigration and other countries like in Europe, um, uh, suburbs um, have developed over the last few decades that um, are generally rushed and there, there isn't a lot of provision for green space. And then low income, um, the low income demographic in these areas sort of um, perpetuates this uh, poverty trap in a way and it, there isn't ever the, I guess, the resources to promote green space. Um, and this is, the, this is true for Europe, uh, the studies in Germany and, and um, uh, I think in Denmark and there's studies across the United States as well that show in different cities there's this inequality. So it's not unique to South Africa. I think the, the extremity, the magnitude of the inequality is unique to South Africa. I would say that. Um, but, uh, and I think that's attributable to our legacy, our history of apartheid. Uh, thanks, Andy. I wanted to come off camera for this. I don't know. I can't see myself, so I don't know if someone can see me. Um, because there's a question here that maybe you want to play a little bit of a devil's uh, advocate, because it's something that occurred to me as well. Um, it's really important work that you've done here. Uh, the person uh, asking the question is, is almost echoing what, what occurred to me. Um, he or she's asking, surely it's intuitive that income would be directly that you, you're testing. So the, the point is, what, what's the outcome of, of it? It's something that we knew intuitively, that's something that, mm. that kind of makes sense from the get go. Um, my own response to that before you answer was that uh, this, this gives us a powerful, quantifiable, quantified visual way of engaging with what we knew intu intuitively. And that, my, that does kind of galvanize certain kinds of action because it's creating a sociological context from for something that we we know intuitively, but that we might have really kind of glossed over, and it's kind of embedding it in consciousness, and then maybe advocacy and activism. Uh, so that was my sense of it. But it would be good to hear why you started with an hypothesis that some would say, you know, such important work, such a lot of work, but it's you know it's what we know already. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic question, and I think you your answer is spot on, and I would align myself with that. Definitely, I think it's, it is, and oftentimes in science, um, we end up trying to test and uh, reject hypotheses that are apparently so obvious <laughs> to the majority of people. But I think it's an important thing to do because um, if we don't test our assumptions, um, uh, you know, they'll remain assumptions. And um, although it seems these inequalities seem obvious and um, a lot of that is based on perception and anecdotal evidence. So um, what we've tried to do is uh, quantify it at a national scale across all district municipalities. And you know, as you say, provide a, 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 a data or you know, a, a empirical evidence for this inequality. And I think it, it, it goes a step further because um, you know, we're not just saying you know, green space is unequally distributed. We, we have a map, we have data where we can see, okay, this census tract, this census tract um, are, uh, should be prioritized for urban greening initiatives because they have uh, the least access, for example. So it, it really is a data-driven tool for decision makers. Um, well, I hope it can be that, um, apart from just stimulating discussion and advocacy. Would you say it's it stimulated discussion amongst groups that otherwise might not have been part of the conversation? And, and this uh, this gathering here, uh, a virtual gathering, is an example of that. Uh, your apprehension about the political questions, my apprehension about the technical questions, have shown that you know two different paradigms coming together can galvanize different mm -hmm. parts of the community and, and sectors. 
and that's the kind of approach you want. And again, uh, you know, uh, as Francesco was saying, we part of a, a project called Big Data for Science and Society. And immediately I thought this is a kind of study that is, you know, for science and society. So, so powerful in, in those respects. Uh, I'll just switch over to the uh, question session because those are coming from the chat and a lot of similar questions. Uh, some really putting you in the hot seat uh, if it's not already hot about, you know, <laughs> who's to blame. But I think it's nice that your, your answers allude to who's to solve and that mm. it's a very sort of, you know, a cooperative kind of solution that one is looking for. Uh, the question about can spatial in injustices be resolved uh, is not one to answer <laughs> anytime soon, uh, but something to problematize and raise. Uh, and I think the more ammunition we have to, to problematize and contextualize that, it's important. I especially liked where your paper was ending, where you spoke about another old overlay of how community perceptions, responses, mm. and behavior needs to be, and that's my interest as well. You know, what do we do yeah. with these maps? We, we need to make them multidimensional and kind of really embedded with, uh, especially in the South African context, because we have mm. this um, heritage uh, in a dirty sense of, of uh, apartheid and, and um, colonization. Uh, the question here, how much of the deforestation can be attributed to the need to use greenery for fuel uh, for cooking for warmth uh, and then um, would you expect similar results where poor and rich live side by side is this trend unique to south africa i think you've answered that uh, so maybe the question about deforestation yeah i think um i think it's it's difficult to i think firstly that's an assumption that i think whoever asked that question should maybe do some research on to, i'm not sure whether uh, people do deforest um, urban green areas. Um, I've had that response quite a bit on social media, but um, I feel like that's an assumption that should be tested without assuming it to be true. And so attributing the, or understanding the drivers of what's causing these inequalities um, is very difficult. And uh, I would posit that um, it's more to do with the initial planning of an urban green, of a, of a suburb that leads to a lack of green infrastructure as opposed to planning a green suburb and then people cutting it down for firewood. I think um, each of those hypotheses are as likely. Um, so yeah, I would be careful about implying that barren suburbs are because people cut it down for firewood firstly. Um, but um, I think having said that, I think there, there's huge scope to, to research things like that and to try and understand in different areas of South Africa what, uh, what might be reducing neighborhood greenness. And if it is people cutting down trees for firewood, what can we do to um, provide alternatives? And um, I think in some of the more uh, peri-urban areas, there's, uh, I've heard anecdotally of um, livestock, you know, um, wreaking havoc with um, newly planted trees and things like that. If you plant fruit trees, um, they would eat them and or browse them and cause damage. So um, there definitely are some obvious drivers of this uh, of urban browning, if you will, that we can try and find creative solutions to. But I think it's important first to test the, the assumptions we have about what's causing the, the lack of green infrastructure. Um, let's jump to another question. It says. Um what is a could your method or what it has produced could it be used to prioritize interventions aimed at reducing inequality um suppose planners want to prioritize allocation development of new urban park spaces could you say where doing so would have the greatest impact in other words make the biggest change for the most people yeah that's a really good question and i sort of hope that um you know maybe a follow-on analysis of what we did would be to um, identify firstly identify municipalities that have that have somehow or other mitigated this inequality. So like um, oh, Tumbo municipality, I think it's in the Eastern Cape, um, and also maybe what census tracts themselves that are very green and maybe are low on the income spectrum. How have they managed to? Uh, um, yeah, conserve urban greenery 
despite their economic status. So if we can learn lessons from the sort of uh, census tract heroes or role models, and at the same time then identify this, the census tracts that have really struggled um, and apply those lessons there, uh, I think yeah, that would be great. And um, yeah, I think they definitely are um, j just by analyzing the, 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 the open areas and cities that are not green at the moment, but can be planted to trees, for example. So identifying patches of ground that are just lying there barren um, is also just a huge practical way of identifying, okay, if we want to plant trees, we can do it here, 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 and here. Um, so I, I do hope that that is a follow on from this work. Thanks. Uh, let, let's jump uh, um, sort of uh, vein a bit. Uh, two uh, more technical questions. One is cloud computing infrastructure a free service? Uh, and another attendee asking for statistical analysis, why did you go with our studio compared to Python? What would be different if you used Python? Um, okay, so for the cloud computing, um, the platform that I used called Google Earth Engine is free for research purposes so you can register for free and it's part of google's geo for good program so they provide things like google earth which i'm sure you all use um, or have used uh, they provide that sort of service for free and it's these services are are leveraging uh, the huge amount of google's cloud computing experience and computational infrastructure um, to provide these services to researchers, to non-for-profits. <clears throat> so it's, it's free in that sense, but otherwise there are paid alternatives, like you can do things on Amazon Web Services and also on the Google Cloud platform. Um, but generally the costs are, re are really reasonable com um, compared to buying your own computing power at home. Um, so that was the first question. The second one about R Studio versus Python for statistics um so i can't i've used python to a limited extent um uh, and definitely not much for statistics but from uh from what i've read uh i think r uh just has a lot more package packages or libraries that facilitate statistical analysis and especially if you in the uh ecology field and um, yeah it, it's there's just a lot more variety to choose from whereas I think Python um, doesn't have as much variety um, yeah that's a simple question a simple answer but um, I don't know enough about Python to answer it comprehensively uh, thanks and uh, how many more minutes um, uh, Francesco if I may uh, ask we have a couple of minutes, so maybe you can try to squeeze in one or two more questions. <laughs> okay. Is there anything you want to, to raise uh, uh, generally in, in light of some of the questions? There are many questions asking about the blame and um, uh, uh, pointing to or what our solutions could be using this kind of data-driven um, analyses. What would be your response uh, at the tail end of, of having done a study like this, uh, Xander? Well, what would be the next step from a research point of view? Uh, many of the questions are asking, so, you know, kind of uh, might be difficult to actually uh, answer. So if you had to, to give us a sense of where to from here in terms of answering what you have positioned as well as a big question, and even your bio has, has indicated your interest in using data science to drive this kind of uh, policy-driven intervention. Uh, yeah. So where to from here? And, and maybe, um, you know, as I, I'll, I'll let you round up from there, um, and while I look for another question, and also to say it's a quite a fortuitous moment, you know, we're looking down to the earth, and, and again, you've pointed to how important that is for us to point instruments downward. And I think SpaceX launched something just Around about the same time you started launching your, your talk. So um, what would be some of the kinds of uh, next stage research? Would you say you'd need a team that brings in more social scientists or more data scientists? Um, yeah. How would we point to 
this research becoming kind of translatable and transferable within the South African context. Uh, as I pull out one question, would, uh, saying we'd like to see and learn how we can green our townships as spaces that were negatively impacted by apartheid. So a lot of the questions are actually kind of comments that, that, that seem to be like questions, but almost thinking aloud. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's why I'm struggling to find one that I find that you can easily answer because it, none of these are easy questions. Yeah, um, I understand. Why the research is so important. So maybe you could round up uh, by kind of speaking to and unpacking that. Yeah, well, I think on a, uh, you know, there's the, the research side and then there's also the more practical, um, maybe advocacy side. And I think on the practical side, uh, you know, it, it probably um, would take some um, groups like Green Pop or some groups in civil society to, I think, um, have initiatives to educate people on how to um, grow and, and, and conserve green space in urban areas. It sounds like a simple, easy thing, but it's, it's actually quite challenging. And simple information on how to do it is, can go a long way. Um, I think sort of merging over to the research side, um, which I alluded to earlier, would I think for me a natural next step would be to sort of uh, create a, a high resolution heat map of uh, potential for urban greening in South Africa. So identifying essentially patches of open space um, that, uh, that have potential for tree planting or garden planting um, in a public space um, because uh, there's not much you can do about the private space. But uh, yeah, providing sort of a high resolution heat map where decision makers can zoom in and, and actually use it to inform their planning. So that's sort of halfway between the practice and the research. But then on the pure research side, I think there's still needs to be a lot of work on the so sociology, yeah, anthropology side of things, which um, is difficult to do in a spatially explicit way um, because often you're relying on survey data or questionnaire data, which is can cost quite a lot of money to collect and you can't you know, easily do it at a national scale. But I think having said that more and more, I think social science um, is being transformed by things like social media and the wealth of data. You know, we in this age of big data where um, if you have some money, you can, you know, for example, query um, Twitter tweets about urban green space across South Africa, and a lot of them are geotagged, and you can start to get a map of of how people perceive green space across South Africa. Um, so you can start to get spatially explicit with sociological data more and more these days. And um, you mentioned SpaceX launching a new satellite, and I think from the remote sensing um, side of things, it's, it's an incredibly exciting, exciting time to be involved in this because there's just so many um, companies and um, uh, people launching Earth observation satellites and we're getting better, better and better at um, taking photos of the Earth at high resolution and, and monitoring changes of the Earth. And I really think it's a powerful tool to democratize science um, uh, yeah, and promote things like citizen science where citizens can um, investigate their surroundings with satellite imagery. So yeah, that sort of touched on a bit of everything, but maybe that's a... That's actually perfect because, uh, and you, you ended with what I was going to uh, push you to towards, uh, which is exactly what the whole paper, it's citizen science. Uh, and it's science within the hands of, of a lay person as well, which I think is ex exceptionally exciting. And, and quite often quantifiable truths need to be visualized for them to gain potency and traction mm. and become embedded in, in our consciousness. So thank you again so much. Uh, apologies if your, your specific question was not answered, uh, but you, you are welcome to, to stay in touch with uh, Xander and Francesco. Thank you so much, um, uh, Xander. Over and back to you, Francesca. Yeah, thank you very much, Mahesh, for, for um, coordinating the, the question and answer session. And thank you very much to the participants for, for asking so many questions. I will share with Xander after the meeting 
the, the list of all the questions <laughs> that you posed and, and, and he might be able to, to reply to, uh, to you. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know now his email address, you will be able to get in touch with him. So Zander, thank you so much for a very, very, very interesting talk. <clears throat> and uh, um, we finished on a, on a, on a really nice note uh, with um, the, 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 the buzzword citizen science uh, falling that's something that um, we need really need to to encourage people to to do more because there are more and more tools like you mentioned that that are free and allow you to 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 really to tackle interesting problems uh, from the comfort of your home during lockdown yeah so <laughs> without having to go anywhere and it just sometimes it just requires a few line of code yeah and and if you don't know those li those line of codes you can just google them yeah and and you find them in stack overflow or, or wherever yeah? there's always someone who has done something similar that you can adapt to your to your purposes to answer the questions that uh, that you want to tackle. So Zander, thank you very much. Uh, we wish you all the best uh, in your further studies in the cold Norway. And, um, and maybe as soon as your next paper comes out on this topic, we, we will invite you <clears throat> again to give us a, a nice uh, update. So thank you very much to, to you, to Mahesh, to, to Ilya, and also to those people behind the scenes that, that make the organization of this event possible and to, and to all the participants for waking up all early and being uh, uh, every week uh, with us. Thank you very much. So Zanda, have, have a good day to you and to, and to everybody. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Francesco. Bye. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.